Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to segment two of day two of Connections of 2016. Uh, we welcome all our new speakers here this afternoon. Give them a round of applause, please. Uh, our topic for today, this afternoon, is transforming India's energy basket to achieve energy sustainability by 2030. Uh, we will start by a presentation, a knowledge paper presentation uh, from one of our colleagues in the PGPX batch. This will be followed by a brief 10-minute presentation by each of our speakers today, which will then be followed by a panel discussion moderated by a Professor Amit Garg. Um, yeah, we'll, I think we'll start. So I invite Rajiv to uh, come give his presentation to us. Give him a round of applause. So after all the exciting uh, discussions we had on various topics, we're going to enter into the hotly debated uh, renewable energy and sustainable energy space. Um, we all know, most of us know, that the government of India has come up with a very aggressive uh, and a very ambitious plan on, am I audible now? All right, okay, thank you. So the government of India has a very ambitious plan of integrating um, 160,000 megawatts of renewable energy into the Indian power grid by the year 2022. Uh, out of this 160,000 megawatts, 100,000 of it is going to be solar PV and 60,000 is going to be uh, wind energy. And, and before I jump into the discussion, I want to make sure we all appreciate the enormity of the size of what 160,000 megawatts actually means. One lakh 60,000 megawatts, that's a huge amount of, of new installed capacity on the system. And if we look at what is the current generation mix that we have, everything that we have installed since independence, we have roughly about 288 gigawatts. That is 2 lakh 88,000 uh, megawatts of energy. So we have 288 gigawatts. And we are trying to, we are targeting to install 160 gigawatts in the next six years, six to seven years. That's a very rapid expansion of renewable energies on the grid. Now, as you can see, uh, roughly 60% of the current generation mix comes from coal. Only 15% comes from renewable energy, and, and that approximates to about 40,000 megawatts of renew renewable energy. Um, and the projected peak demand on the system in 2022, according to the Central Electricity Authority, is going to be about 239 gigawatts. So put that into the context, we have 239 gigawatts of load, we are going to install 160 gigawatts of renewables when we already have 288 gigawatts. Now I'm not trying to say uh, we have more than what we need. Obviously, uh, the 160 gigawatts does not mean we actually get the full output. Uh, the, the capacity factor of the renewables is generally much lower than their, uh, their actual nameplate rating. Um, but, but what it does tell you, though, is we are making some very rapid strides in, in trying to ensure that the the power grid that we have gets decarbonized in a very, very quick and uh, you know swift manner. Now, if you if you say you know if you mention the numbers like 160,000 megawatts of renewable energy to any power engineer, you know power system planners, strategy guys, power system operators, uh, like I am, <laughs> we tend to cringe a little. You know, as much as we really love renewable energy. It, it makes us a little, you know, unstable from inside. And that's because the renewable energy sources, wind and solar, are variable in nature, which means we cannot control the output of either wind or solar at any given point on any given day. And power system engineers are control freaks. We want everything under our control. We want to be able to very fine-tunedly, uh, in a fine-tuned kind of a fashion, be able to control every single generator on the grid at any point of time. Because that's what provides the grid with the stability it needs. So if you understand the power grid, it's basically a very fine-tuned machine where the load and the generation has to be balanced at any point of time. We cannot afford to have more load than generation or more generation than load. 
So there has to be that fine balance on the power grid at all times on a second to second basis. So now once when we start to have this huge amount of solar and wind, which we know we cannot control, that causes problems on the grid. And and there are, as, as we'll see uh, at a later point in the presentation, there are other uh, countries in the world which, which are trying to expand renewable energy as quickly as we are trying to, and they are facing a whole lot of uh, problems. Now, when I say we'll have problems with uh, solar PV, what kind of problems are we talking about? Uh, this, is, this is how a solar PV output can look like. Uh, you know, it goes from, uh, goes from zero all the way up to its max, and from max it comes rapidly down to zero again over just a period of about 10 hours. And in between these 10 hours, you can have these big, huge variations. And when you have these variations, it just means that the other forms of energy, non-conventional resources like coal and natural gas, hydro, whatnot, they should also be moving in sync with this huge variation to ensure that the load and generation balance is always maintained. The problem, though, is these other forms of non-conventional, uh, non-variable energy uh, kind of resources, which is the coal and natural gas, they are not designed to operate this way. They cannot move as rapidly as this, uh, at least not the current fleet of generation that we have on the Indian grid. Uh, and, and at the risk of maybe offending some power engineers, the kind of power grid we have, not just in India, but across the world, we have a really Jurassic kind of a grid. It's been designed all the way back in, you know, early, uh, early part of the 20th century, and the fundamentals of how, the, how we generate the power, how we transmit, and how we distribute the power, it hasn't changed at all. In fact, electricity is one of the few sectors of the modern day economy that have largely managed to, you know, maintain their, their status quo despite the huge digital revolution we had over the past two to three decades. Which is, which is actually turning out to be a big problem once when we start to integrate huge amounts of renewables. So we said about six months back, uh, we started saying, OK, we know it's going to probably have some problems. Uh, 160 megawatts is a, 160 gigawatts is a huge amount of energy. So what kind of a problem is it going to be? Can we quantify it? Can we can we come up with a you know, qualitative and quantitative analysis of the problems that it will cause on the grid? So we've been doing some research work for the past you know, five, six months um, to, to really do some assessment. And uh, given I'm an engineer and I'm a you know, mathematical modeling freak, I obviously needed to have a model um, that, that I can base my analysis on. Uh, and we had a lot of paucity of data. So we, we basically relied on a lot of public data sources. So I, uh, we pulled in, um, you know, surface meteorology data from NASA. NASA has, you know, uh, this data for the entire world. Uh, we pulled in data from uh, SAURAN, which is a very high quality solar uh, profile output data on a real time basis in South Africa. And we pulled all this data, we tried to equivalentize it between, you know, other parts of the globe and, and how it might be in India. We added some Indian flavors to it by taking, you know, the Central Electricity Authority load data and whatnot. Those are all, you know, complicated details. I'm not going to get into that. Um, and and we worked on it. We, you know, mixed it up. We baked it and whatnot. And we came up with a model essentially. And the model that we came up with basically showed a solar PV profile that looks like this. Basically, a bell-shaped curve uh, where the output starts to rapidly go up starting around 7, 7.30 in the morning, reaches the max output around 11 to 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then starts to very steeply come down from 2 o'clock around 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock is when 6 or 6.30, right around that time is when the solar output goes to zero. Um, and that's a very typical um, load profile of how the the, the load on the Indian grid looks like during summertime. So what I'm going to do now, just to make sure you all understand uh, the, 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 the problem that's going to show up on the Indian grid, I'm going to take this load profile and I'm going to start superimposing different levels of solar PV output onto that load profile 
and I'm going to show you how the load profile fundamentally changes its characteristic, all right? Let's see. So this is just, you know, keep an eye on that load profile in the next slide. So this is, this is about 25 gigawatts of solar PV output. Uh, the gray line you see right on top is the original load profile curve of the Indian grid. And once when you, you know, uh, integrate 25 gigawatts, it starts to change, right? This is 25 gigawatts of uh, integration. And this is 50 gigawatts. This is 75 gigawatts. And this is 100 gigawatts. So as we can see, here we have a grid that was relatively flat during the day. Now it has become an entirely U-shaped curve during the daytime, which means that the conventional resources, solar, uh, not solar, the coal and the natural gas that used to supply power during this time, they have to be displaced, which means they have to be turned off to make way for this solar energy. And, and we start reducing a huge amount of conventional generation, starting from 8 o'clock all the way down to 2, 2 p.m. And from 2 p.m., we again have to start cranking them up in a very steep fashion all the way up to 6 o'clock in the evening. And this ramp up is something that our grid is not designed for. The typical coal units have a startup time of 12 hours. The latest generation supercritical technology, they probably can do it in like about 7 to 8 hours. And the really old units, they probably take about 24 hours to start up. And we are asking them to go from zero to full output of minutes. And that's what I'm saying, the grid is not designed to handle this kind of an output. So, so basically, to, to clarify the numbers, we are asking for the grid to turn off 91 gigawatts, that is 91,000 megawatts of conventional energy in a matter of about, you know, four to six hours from morning till afternoon, and from evening, two o'clock, or afternoon, two o'clock, all the way up to evening, six o'clock, we need to turn on 98,000 megawatts of coal, natural gas, hydro units. And that's a, that's a problem. And, and um, obviously, you know, it's, it's a big problem. Can we, is, is, there, is, there, is there any comparison between the problems that we are seeing in India versus what the other countries may have seen? And we see that California in the United States has a similar aggressive goal of integrating solar and wind onto the grid. And you see there is an exactly similar kind of a pattern where as you start integrating more and more solar PV, the, the profile changes fundamentally. And on a system that has 45,000 megawatts of peak load, they need 13,000 megawatts of ramping. That, that steep increase in generation is called as ramping, power system speed. Um, they need 13,000 megawatts of ramping in a matter of three to four hours. And California, they did all the research and they figured out, can be done. We cannot do it with the existing fleet. Um, Germany, Germany had a similar problem. Germany had, uh, you know, a very, very lucrative feed-in tariffs where they were uh, trying to encourage solar PV, more and more solar PV. And they got to a point where they started seeing similar ramping needs on the system and they said, this is something that we need to get under control and they started pulling back the feed-in tariffs. So this is a problem that, that other areas in the world are also seeing. It's not unique to India. It's just how the existing old-time technology, uh, power system technology, uh, has remained in place for all these years. And now all of a sudden we start doing something new that it cannot adapt to this. So fundamentally the problem though is we we have a flexibility problem. That's, that's again, a terminology that, that is generally used, which means the existing uh, generation fleet is not flexible enough. It's not flexible enough to go up and down several times a day. So that's called as a flexibility problem. And what do you do when you, when you have a system that is not flexible enough? Simple answer is make it flexible. Can we make the power system flexible so that we can keep integrating more and more solar and wind? and at the same time take care of the power system stability. And, and the problem that we have is basically threefold. It's not just a technology problem. 
it's also the problem of cost. We don't want to you know, spend exorbitant amounts of money in doing it. And in the Indian context, the timing is also a very critical criteria because we are trying to integrate all of this solar energy by 2022, which means the amount of time we have is very limited. Right? So timing is also a criteria. So, so probably thinking about this solution space, uh, you know, what, what can we do to create flexibility on the grid? Um, as the adage goes, you know, what gets paid gets done, really. Um, so California started uh, what's called as a flexibility product on the grid, which means they started saying, if there is a generator that is flexible enough to meet the requirements, we will pay you more just for the amount of flexibility you bring to the grid. For, they get other kinds of payments for the energy, for the capacity, and for the auxiliary services. They provide the, the, a lot of complicated technical detail. But apart from all of that, they said, if your generator is flexible enough to meet the requirements, we will pay you more for that flexibility. So if we start considering flexibility as an asset to the grid, and if we create a framework, a policy framework where we say we pay the flexibility, then generation will automatically come. The right kind of technologies will come. And that's exactly what happened in California. And once when this is actually still in the works, and in anticipation of this uh, coming up, lots of new natural gas units that have good flexibility, a lot of battery storage technologies that can ramp up like in a snap. Hydros, they went through the ret retrofits to make sure uh, there is enough ramping up. Everything started coming in to make sure that they are able to monetize the flexibility of their machines. So that's, that's a very critical piece of the puzzle that is currently missing from the Indian policy framework uh, in the electricity sector. So this is something that we need to pay very close attention to um, in, in, in our policy framework. And, and there are lots, there is no one single um, solution that will solve the problem for us entirely. You know, whole slew of solutions need to be looked at. And when you say flexibility, flexibility can be approached from both ends, from the generation side and the demand side. I mean, if, if I want generation to go up steeply, I can actually build more generation that can go up steeply, or I can make my load flexible enough to come down steeply as and when I need. Right? That's also flexibility on the grid. That's something that the operators can, can utilize um, as a part of their tool set. So, there can be generation-based flexibility where we have a you know, bunch of technologies like pumped hydro, uh, offshore wind. Wind, ha wind by its very nature is complementary to the solar PV uh, technology. In the sense, once when the sun starts to set and the solar output starts to go down, that's exactly when the wind starts to pick up, which means the wind output starts to go up. And, and the, and the steepness with which the offshore wind goes up is much higher than the steepness with which the onshore wind. So we already have, you know, we are actually doing plenty in, uh, in, in installing more and more onshore wind, which is wind energy on land. And in our research, we found that, um, unfortunately, the onshore wind will not be sufficient to, to take care of this problem enough. So we need to look at offshore uh, wind um, uh, technologies as well, and natural gas. Natural gas, by its very nature, can ramp up very quickly in a matter of minutes. And compressed air energy storage, that this is one other technology that holds a lot of potential, just that the cost is high enough. So, you know, there are new solutions that are being explored to, to bring down the cost of compressed uh, um, storage. Now, I know there's a lot here, and we have a time constraint too, so I'm going to touch upon the, the one green box there, which says IoT and big data-driven smart grids. Um, and obviously, there are other solutions on the demand side flexibility too, where we can uh, come up with differential pricing, the, the time of use. If you use electricity at the peak load hours, you'll be charged more. So that increases the uh, tendency to reduce the power usage. So things like that, they can, um, they, they definitely work. But this. IoT and, and big data analytics has a very, very critical role to play in the sense that today, sitting here in this room, we don't know what's happening on the transmission grid. We don't know what the operator's needs are. 
you know, do they have enough generation or not? We don't know. And sitting at the operator's desk, they don't know what is the power consumption in my household or in this hall, and what is the power consumption going to be in the next one to two hours. There are some ideas in this IoT and uh, big data driven smart grid space which are trying to remove that opacity between the transmission grid and the load, where you have a smart meter sitting on a household, you have a rooftop solar, and you have a battery in your house. The battery absorbs all the power during the day, it stores all the, uh, all the energy in the battery, and right around when there's a steep increase, the smart meter sitting there, it, it decides the house owner is probably going to be coming around 6, 7 o'clock and, and there, is, there is a certain usage pattern of the house owner in the next few minutes to few hours. So it decides how much of it should I release into the household, how much of it can I pump back into the grid. And for the energy that pumps, uh, gets, pump, uh, gets pumped back into the grid, the house owner gets paid. So there's a new revenue source that is being generated which will actually make all these big data technologies very viable in the future. So th that's something, that is, there's a lot of work being done. So I'm, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, stop here, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Professor Garg.